Welcome to Drudgery Dreams and In Between, the podcast for neurodivergent weirdos and queers who forget about struggling to adult. They're struggling to human. At least that's what everyone's telling us. You're right. Per usual, but seriously. I'm Angela. People call me Mama Pistachio, bringing sense to the conversation. I help individuals and organizations cultivate skills, spaces, and confidence to advocate for themselves and each other. And I'm Molly, giving a big fork you to cookie cutter solutions. I help busy as fuck neurodivergent entrepreneurs make shit happen by bringing stability to their businesses while helping them do what makes sense to their brain. Enough with the chit chat. Let's get down to business. What's the freaking point? With our powers combined, we navigate life through the drudgery dreams and all that shit in between. Plus, we were already having these conversations anyway, so why not record them, right? Alrighty then. Get ready to call bullshit on what everyone's saying you should be doing as we navigate the spectrum between what your heart wants and the shit keeping you from it. Ah! Sorry, I had to (laughs) squeal. It's It's good. It's good. Yay. (laughs) It's so fun to watch your work come together. It's so fun. Hi, Molly. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. And it's also just like, we finally did it. Yay. After all this time, after all of the conversations. Yes. Yeah. We did it. Here we are. Yes, I'm just going to be squeaky velociraptor all day. Right, Um, right, right. (laughs) All right. So we're here to talk about transitions. Yeah, we love them. We hate them. Yeah. 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 It feels like in the moment that we hate them way more. (laughs) I feel like for a lot of them. True. Uh, Like beforehand. Yes. For me, it's beforehand, right? Like I can spend hours and go into a full meltdown because of transitioning from one thing to another it's yes. ridiculous and then afterwards it's like okay okay yeah <laughs> yeah um i have sort of the opposite well not opposite i have a different reaction when i know like a transition's coming up i'm just like i can't do any of the things i am just a blob i'm blobbing my way till that happens like right uh So I got back from vacation Friday, um, up until vacation, two months to the vacation. I was just like, can't do anything going on vacation in two months. Like, so, um, that I think a lot of my peer group, our peer group, the neurodivergent peer group has that same kind of like, something's coming and I just can't do anything. Um, so and especially with the little, because yeah. I have a five-year-old and transitions are, are not easy when we are five and neurodivergent at all. Um, and I was dreading the reaction that Blaine was going to give to the transition. Like, I was just like, are we going to have a meltdown? Because we're changing where we're sleeping. We're changing what we're doing. Like, so yep. that was definitely a big one. Um, what well, is, because it is hard, you know, like... Don't get me wrong. I enjoy traveling, but I really don't enjoy traveling. I like, I like my space. I like my bed. I like my routine. I like having my coffee that I make with my things and my cup. Um, so some of the joy and wonder that you can get from traveling is taken away if you don't prepare beforehand and maybe sometimes even allow yourself to take some of those comfort items with you. Like I know a lot of people will be like, seriously, you're like, you're taking your cup with you. Like, yeah, I'm taking my cup. Yeah. It's your happy cup. Right. Like why would I not take my cup when that cup helps me feel good? Mm -hmm. It's not hurting you. It's not hurting me. It's not hurting anybody. So I'm going to take my damn cup. Right. Um, You know, that's, some little space. In your exactly. Luggage. Exactly. And so you as a parent have to be aware and cognizant of that for your five-year-old because they are not able to do that themselves. Right. Yet. And like, so we, we had the checklist of the like must goes or like return to the home, whether you're 30 minutes away from the home to the airport things like we got to take big Yoda. 
There's no replacement for Big Yoda. We don't fall asleep without Big Yoda. Take the melatonin. Right. <laughs> Take yeah. the melatonin. Um, and this time I came prepared because last time we did Disney World, it was a disaster. Yeah, this time uh, last year was awful. Right? It was awful. It like was I, awful. I cried every night because right. I thought I had ruined our favorite vacation spot. I thought I had like ruined all the things. Anyway, uh, this year I came prepared because at school, Blaine had been taught to use a solutions bracelet. And so I was like, oh, that's like a known skill. Yeah. Um, so I built a Disney vacation solutions bracelet and I made it with it themed for Disney. We did an inside out theme and did all the emotions because uh, Blaine's familiar with all of those emotions. And then um, like the popcorn bucket, the the actual bed that Blaine was going to be sleeping. And I found a photo of that, like the be our guest dining room for hunger, like all of those things so that it was exciting to use, but also yeah. familiar. Um, and I, that really helped with the transition. Also having constant popcorn on tap as your safe snack. Um, um yes. <laughs> oh, and I will give a giant kudos to Disney for finally putting safe foods on the menu. Oh, that's There was great. chicken nuggets and mac and cheese at every restaurant and Blaine has now toured every mac and cheese. Okay. Cool. Of Disney world. <laughs> but yes. So those were, those are the little things that helped the five-year-old transitions. So it was really. Which therefore really helps the adult transitions. Oh, yes. I I didn't cry. Right. right. <laughs> Not that crying's right. bad, but like I didn't cry frustration tears. Um, yeah. Our conversations this year after the trip are completely different than our oh, conversations yeah. last year after the trip. Yeah. I, like It was funny because I felt like last year I Marco Poloed everybody like every day. Like, this is terrible. What have I done? Why would I take a child that I know <laughs> can't do this? Why would I do this? And this year I didn't even talk to anybody. <laughs> right. I didn't message. I didn't email. didn't open my phone. I just had fun. <laughs> right. Right. And you've learned so much. Oh, yeah. You've learned. I would say that both of us have. This has been a year of transition. Oh, yeah. Right? Like, both of us have learned so much. So many things have happened. Um, you know, it, for me, the big transition this year was literally spending basically the whole year through the diagnostic process. Yeah, yeah. And and that whole learning piece about, you know, okay, cool, you were diagnosed ADHD at 22. That's 23 years ago, y'all. Um, <laughs> and so you had things in place and you worked with therapists and you learned how to deal with that, but there's still this thing that's not right. And, you know, here you are in the military and you've made all of these transitions and you've moved a lot in the last couple of years. And you're at us in a space that is not sensory <laughs> mm. relevant to you in any way, shape or form. And I go back to the psychiatrist and I'm like, oh my gosh, I need some help. And so we start talking and it's like, oh, there's this other thing happening. And, you know, 45 years old. Hi, I'm autistic. Um, gosh, this Surprise. explains. Right. Gosh, this explains <laughs> so much. And um, let's talk about those transitions that we had in the school year for all of the years that I was a teacher not let alone being a student, but all of the years being a teacher, like, oh my gosh, transitions. We know about transitions. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and I, I remember the day that you, you were like, I need to talk to you. And I was like, okay, what do you need to talk to me about? Like, you're so serious about it. And so we get in the call and you're like, do you think I'm autistic? And I'm like, you don't? Like, it was that moment of like, Angela. Um, so I, as the and, teacher and the expert and somebody who deals with this and this is my client base and right. Yes. I was just like, <laughs> don't you? like, it was, <laughs> I, I just remember that conversation distinctly. And that's when you were like, okay, I just need to make sure. And like, then you were yeah. able to like continue that journey. And that, 
that major transition is to how you referred to yourself. And I remember the first time you publicly were like, hi, I'm Angela and I'm autistic. I was like, yay, speaking of Velociraptor Prime. <laughs> like, because it was, right. it was transitioning even more into who you truly are. Like your yeah. identity was like unfolding. Yeah. The onion is escaping. Yeah. Uh, like al so. Just allowing yourself, like, like for example, to <laughs> exactly, <laughs> for example, too, like before that I was, you know, like, you know, there's all of this, you know, why did I not recognize it? Well, there's all of this internalized ableism and, and this right. and that, but you know, like I would sit in my chair and I would like, you know, hold my hands down like this so that I wasn't constantly, you know, doing these things. And I, you know, the, the helicopters or the jets or whatever would fly over and I, w I would get excited and my body language would go because I didn't allow myself to be like, you know, like, my, <laughs> like I do yeah. every single time there's a helicopter, like I get excited. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, that has been, that's the love part of transitions, like transitioning mm -hmm. into good, healthy spaces. Cool. Great. Yeah. But then there's those other ones. But then there's those other ones, right? There's those other yeah. transitions that are, that are rough. What transitions are rough for you? So this one's kind of funny. I used to love moving. I used to love it when I was a kid and all I had to do was unpack. Loved it. Or starting school. Cause it's, to me, it's a clean slate, whatever. Yeah. Now as an adult in a and household. school supplies. And school supplies. <laughs> oh my gosh. Sticky notes. And colorful markers. <laughs> yes. Uh, color coding your notebooks. Yay. <laughs> Oh, and then folding the brown paper packs to put on your textbooks. To put on your books and making your own little. And like drawing on them. <laughs> oh my God. Which reminds me, this is, I don't know if I ever told you this. So I passed chemistry class because me and my other friends who looking back were also just as neurodivergent as I was. We made a language that was like alien in nature and wrote the entire periodic table on our notebooks. That's great. You're such a nerd. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so anyway, okay. I digress. Um, so one of the things that I do not like now about transitions for moving um, is because um, being in a household of other neurodivergent folks who have different responses to moving mm -hmm. than I do, um, I can't handle the stress of their stress and it's right. too much. So it's caused me to like, not like moving at all. Um, that is, I mean, there's still that like slight love of it, of like new thing, but for most of it, it's, I just don't want to deal with that person's. I don't know how to explain it because it's more of like, I can't, I have to mask. I guess that's what it is. I have to mask my response to the situation because the other people in my family cannot handle the transition. And so right. I have to be the like cohesive, like we're going to get through, we're going to get through, <laughs> take right. it one day at a time um, part. And I'm let's trying... face it, that's kind of, when you are a neurodivergent woman, mom, wife, some of the traditional <clears throat> expectations on you are that you are that caretaker. Mm -hmm. You know, for years, that's the box and the bubble that I put myself in. I tried, <laughs> I tried, <laughs> I failed um, to be that soccer mom who does it all. And, you know, in the long run, I ended up, I swear that this contributed to me having cancer because you can only pretend to be somebody who you're not for so long, but we get put into those roles. Um, and when you're a gender queer woman and that role and those expectations don't quite 
fit you, but you are expected by society and everything to fit into that, that adds to it. That's the mask that you're talking about. Like I have to pretend to be this person. I'm strong. I take care of everybody. I'm, I can organize everything and I can make everything happen because, you know, I, you know, was in the air force and I know how to do all of this stuff and and I can do it. (laughs) And you don't get to get the rest that you need to deal with your own (laughs) part of that transition. And it's funny you bring up the Air Force. I think my worst transition ever was when I got out of the Air Force. I I can see that. That's for a lot of military folks, yeah. neurodivergent or not, um, transitioning from the military back into civilian yeah. life is, well, I mean, I know we're, <laughs> well, we're that's a year, like right. We're a, a year out from that and I'm already having meltdowns, like legitimate, full on, you've seen me. Yeah have legitimate full on I had one yesterday over my laptop not having the best internet access for us to podcast from the area in my house that I wanted to um and then when we you know like why did you have such a strong reaction to that well we have these things coming up and that's a year away right but that's what a transition in the military is it starts a year before it happens. If you're lucky. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, and if you're, if you're certain that that's what you're going to do is be transitioning out. Yeah. If you're separating. Yeah. Yeah. Because we had, I'm trying to think when I was retired, I found out in August and I officially retired in October but I had leave. So like I was done or no, I officially retired in November. And so it was October 1st was my first day off. So I really only had like six or eight weeks. Yeah. Now there were a lot of other transitions <laughs> in that time period. Right. Uh, Cause we had some unforeseen accidents happen. Um, and that caused extra chaos to that transition. Um, yeah. But like when Steven, my partner medically retired like that transition was different because then we could plan it a little bit because then nobody was going to be in the military um right. yes I'm trying to think what is what transition do you struggle with the most um I have quite a few I struggle with transitions in general um the way I used to deal with that is that I would never plan anything because if anything went just a little bit off of the plan, it would send me over. I didn't recognize that at the time. And that's mm-hmm. part of what led to the, you know, being diagnosed with ADHD was this impulsive thing, but it wasn't impulsive. It was, um, it was, if it can't go to plan, I'd rather not have it planned. Because then mm-hmm. I, I really, for example, and I, I don't know that I don't know that everybody would would say that this is a, a transition, but it kind of is. It's in the same framework. Going to a restaurant. So mm. first of all, leaving my house to go and do something, that's a transition. Yeah. It's a transition that I have to work up to. If it is I okay, I'm gonna stick with the restaurant thing. I'm going to go to the restaurant. I get the same thing every time. I never get something different at, at a restaurant. It's the same thing. This is what I like. This is what I get. And I get there and they don't have it. I can't just move into, oh, well, I'm going to get something else. It's we have to go to a different restaurant or we have to go home. Oh, okay. Um, because I, in that moment, of making those decisions to get something else and and to try something new and this and that that is very very difficult for me but so is the transition from bed to up ah um so so is the transition of taking a shower Mm. um and all of that is because of the sensory stuff that goes along with it so Mm -hmm. 
for for me, so see, transitions can be difficult or easy for people for different reasons. And for me, a lot of it is the sensory stuff that goes along with it, right? Like the transition from being wet to being dry mm. is very, very difficult for me. So I have to do work on my nervous system <laughs> before I take a shower. Yes. While I'm in the shower. And then when I get out of the shower in order to be able to handle it and not have it cause like this big stressful event. I just like, I see my body like reacting to it, just thinking about it because it is very, very difficult for me. Um, yeah. So those are just a few examples of, I'm going to give you one more. And I know that you know this one. So my friend Megan lived in San Diego and I had been talking to her you know, we've been talking online for like a year or whatever. We're going to meet face to face in person. And that caused me the most stress. Like I had a full on meltdown, like yelling and crying and everything between like for the couple of hours leading up to it until like two minutes before I got out of my car. And that was the transition period, right? Yeah. That was really difficult for me. Once I was actually there having this conversation with her one-on-one, -on -one, like sitting in that, perfectly fine. But it was the transition to that point that mm -hmm. was very difficult for me. Yeah. That reminds me of two things. So going back to the shower thing. So I do not like getting wet. Like if I choose to get wet, on my own accord, that is fine. I'm okay. But just because a person's in the pool does not mean they want you to get them wet. And that I negatively and hostily respond anytime I get splashed in a pool. So right. when we were at Disney, we were in the wave pool and Blaine's trying to be playful. I have contacts in, mind you, because nobody wants their glasses to fly off on vacation. Right. Um and he splashed, Blaine splashed me. And I was like, we are not doing that. <laughs> like, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. And the person behind me is like, you're in a pool. You're going to get splashed. And I'm like, like <laughs> getting all nasty about it. But like, I can't handle the unexpected wetness. Also, water is so slimy. Why is water slimy? <laughs> no. Um, so there's that one, but that reminded me, you asked me what my least favorite transition, unexpected transitions, like not according to anticipated plans and the subsequent possibilities that you've already planned out. Right. I have foreseen that these things might happen and these are how I'm going to react to those things. Mm -hmm. And normally I still react more positively in these situations than uh, my partner, <laughs> you but prepare we... yourself to respond. And Correct. when you are put in a situation where you have to react, it's very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. <laughs> so we went, had flown to, to Puerto Vallarta and we were coming back. Now, this is just going to sound entitled and, and just bougie. Um, we fly first class, but we do that. Hasn't six foot tall. We need space. It's quieter. We need food because I need alcohol to get through the flight. <laughs> like there's a lot of reasons that aren't just like we're prissy and we want it to be fancy. Um, like <laughs> there's reason, like it's quieter. Like all of those things help set the mood. And for me, I'm already anxious on the flight. If I feel sardini, I'm going to have a panic attack. Mm -hmm. That space helps. So we were flying back. The first flight went fine. Second flight got canceled. Not only did they put us on a different airline, one that we've chosen never to fly on, <laughs> but they put us down to economy, which was fine, theoretically. <laughs> but like everything, like all of those transitions to having to go to a different terminal, then taking away our like we they we like the lounges because they're quiet and when you fly international you get the lounge 
for free. Well, when they degraded our ticket, they took away the lounge access. Right. So then we couldn't get back in. And then we, we were paying for the thing and we couldn't get the thing. And then the other airline was like, hi, piece of dirt, please sit here. You know, like they like the, the one of the things we kept talking about was how differently they treat people. And like that transition was like, wait, why are you treating people differently between these two? Like everybody's paying to be on this flight. And right. um, then the whole time I'm crying because I'm like, these people think I'm crying because I didn't get my fancy seat, but I just need booze to make it through the flight. And like, <laughs> Cause they had given us like a, exit row so we had plenty of leg room and stuff but like that transition and it is so unexpected that I just I then was not just reacting to the actual situation I was reacting to how the people were perceiving my reaction to the thing and then I like just kept spiraling and squeaking and the whole flight throw a little RSD in there while we're at it (laughs) I was just like "Ah." so yeah I cried the whole way home but Stephen was fine. <laughs> and and you know what? That's that's one of those funny things, right? Like Stephen is fine in those situations. And that's where he gets to step up and he gets to shine and take care of you. Yeah. And then, you know, you are dealing more with the domestic stuff and making sure and and so that's something to look at too. But I wanna I wanna talk about this for just a minute because you are lucky to have the financial means Mm -hmm. to have the things that you need when you are traveling. Yeah. A lot of people are not Mm -hmm. and are not able to do that, but they have those same needs, not necessarily booze, (laughs) but, but they have those same needs to have a quiet space. Um, to be able to move, mm-hmm. um, which creates, it makes it very difficult for some people to be able to travel. So they don't. Right. Um, and, and, you know, that's when we start looking at, at social, the social mm-hmm. aspect of neurodiversity, um, it costs, it can cost you more. Oh, yeah. to do all the things because of the accommodations that you have to make for yourself. Yes. Right. Um, it like, for example, if you're traveling on a train, there are some people who are perfectly fine. They don't need a cabin. They're, you know, they just travel on the train. No problem. But then there are some who have to pay to have a cabin because they have to have a space where they can get away from everybody or where they can have something or where they can, you know, rest without all of the sensory stuff coming in. Um, So that's one of the things that people talk about, um, you know, with the, the, you know, the big one right now, if you look around on, on social media and stuff is the ADHD tax. And that is, have you, have you heard of this? Have you heard of this? Um, This is totally, I don't necessarily think on topic, but actually it is because part of this, we were going to be talking about that time blindness thing. Yes. Right. So this isn't exactly time blindness, but okay. Look at the ADHD tax of um, buying things, putting them in your refrigerator, completely forgetting that they're there. And so you've spent all of this money, right? That is a true statement. (laughs) It is. It is. So in order to deal with that, you have to have the ability, the executive function to be able to plan ahead, to purchase things that help you be organized. And a lot of people can't do that themselves. They don't have those skills yet. So then they are paying somebody to help them do that. Um, So all of these little things, accessibility things for neurodivergent folks. And it sounds silly when we're talking about groceries in your refrigerator, but that adds up. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure (laughs) that there is a ton of food that gets thrown away every month because I forget it's there. 
And right. I have like clear drawers. It's not like they're hidden. Like I just, it's not ketchup, French fries. And right. Or the, ti- or the time blindness thing, right? Of, oh. I need to buy this much food to get me through this amount of time. Yes. And so you overbuy, not realizing exactly what you're going to do. So you have to be very like regimented in that, which is not necessarily something that all people who are neurodivergent can do without paying somebody for some support in making that happen. Yeah. That's why we, again, this sounds entitled. Uh, That's why we were doing those meal plan things for a long time is because the specific amount that we needed was showing up for that meal. And then I didn't have to think about it. And it it was like, Oh, pick a card, make the thing. Um, but the time blindness thing with meat, I buy meat. I put it in the fridge. I try not to buy more than three meats at a time. Mm -hmm. Somehow two weeks have passed. That meat is now green and you know, we can't use it. Right. So that time blindness is a thing, but yeah, no, I mean, it is more expensive in general especially if you do not have someone with the executive function in your house to do things. Right. Um, so right. I, to yeah. create those menu boards to, and then, oh my gosh, something happens. Something happens that you're not expecting. And now that menu item, that is thrown off. You can't have that meal this week. You know, or you can't have that meal on this night when you had planned it. And then now everything is, you know. Yes. Uh, what about the, um, I go shopping and everything sounds good that I picked up. I put it in my fridge. I get home. The next day I go to cook something. Everything looks, smells. The idea of it is disgusting. And now you have to go out because you can't eat the things that you already have in your house. Right. Or you just pop a bag of popcorn. Yep. Yeah. Right. Like, um, that is a, that's a big thing. And, you know, it's one of the things I do this for myself, but one of the big things that I work with, you know, a lot of people, you and I've worked on this too, Mm -hmm. is that how can I deal with all the things throughout the day so that when dinner time comes, I am able to eat a well-balanced, healthy meal um, rather than go for my safe food because that's the only thing I can stomach at the moment. Um, That's difficult. It's one of, I would say that is probably, food is the most difficult thing for me. Weight is a very difficult thing for me. Um, Number one, because when I get under a certain amount of weight, I can't feel my body. And I have to work really hard to have the awareness of where my body is in space. Um, So when I have, (laughs) yeah, when I have more weight on my body, um, that actually helps me feel comfortable and safe in my body. You just made me have an epiphany of why I'm so uncomfortable when, because we've talked about this before, because when I was much heavier, it hurt. Right. I'm now realizing that's because on a normal basis, I have no clue where my limbs are. And then I could actually feeling it. And that was just, I don't want to (laughs) feel. Right. Right. Okay. So I mean, thanks for the epiphany. Yeah. I, we could probably do an entire episode on, on food and eating and and proprioceptive awareness and, and all of this. But, um, that is, um, it's difficult. Like food can be Alfredo, no bark. Um, (laughs) food can be a, a real issue and the transition of food, like talk about Blaine for a second. Hmm. I'm um, sorry. I just can't get over the fact that you're talking about food and your dog's named Alfredo. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Just, just to be fair. Well, my dog's name was Pepper. No, um, <laughs> um, but uh, Alfredo is my husband's dog. And he said, if I get a white dog, its name is going to be Alfredo. And if I get a brown dog, its name is going to be Meatball. And um, because he's obsessed with food, like food is his mm-hmm. one big obsession. Right, I mean- um, 
And uh, so, yes, the dog was going to have a food name. Okay. I can move on now. Blaine and food. Um, <laughs> yes. So when Blaine was really little, he would eat Blaine or they would eat anything. Uh, and it really wasn't a big deal until they started to like become more verbal because we had a speech delay, all that stuff. And so then we finally had words and could communicate what we wanted. Um, and now uh, a lot of, well, I should say the past two years at preschool, they had a lunch or daycare. They had a specific lunch and it was all that they had. And that sometimes meant that Blaine didn't eat until he, until they got home. And so we implemented the rule that dinner time was going to be safe food time because a child needs to eat. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you and I had talked about how, well, and just watching like siblings and talking to other friends, um, being forced to eat foods that physically make you ill is not okay. Um, and so it does not bother me <laughs> to make chicken nuggets and know that my kid is eating. Um, and we never like, it's never a, you have to eat everything on your plate or like we, we do encourage, like, can you just take a bite to see what you think? Like, right. And if, if, if there's a smell and Blaine goes, Oh no, that sounds disgusting. Then, you know, like we don't yeah. push it, but so like there's certain meals Blaine will try like spaghetti and meatballs loves chicken nuggets has to be specific chicken nuggets. I cannot just buy any chicken nuggets. Right. So we always have to buy like the safe chicken nuggets and a new brand to, you know, um, not all French fries are created equal. That's are all tater tots. I mean, th let's be honest. These things are, these things are true. So Blaine and Jordan, Jordan's my husband. They are very similar with that eating mm -hmm. stuff. So tell me, tell me what that, the transition looks like for food, because for Jordan, mm -hmm. it's a very specific thing that is very different than my own. Um, mm -hmm. And so the traditional, we sit down as a family and we sit around the table at such and such time and we eat together and that can be difficult when you've got multiple neurodivergent folks in the house mm -hmm. because uh, especially around food, right? Because yeah. for Jordan, like he gets off work and it's dinner time. So if he gets off work at three o'clock, it's dinner time when he gets home. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not ready to eat dinner. I'm not ready to cook dinner. Um, so is there some of that same stuff going on in your house? The transitions for meals? Uh sort of uh we don't have like formal dinner times or lunch times on the weekends like it's more of a you hungry no you hungry kind of i'm hungry yeah we'll make some food uh or it's like you're on your own like blaine blaine can say i'm hungry and then we make food uh i just call them a grazer they're mm -hmm. they're a grazer uh because I don't want to counteract the inherent uh, instinct for food. And so I haven't tried training food times or anything. Uh, as far as like Steven gets home, we usually eat within the hour. Blaine also goes to bed at six. So we don't have a lot of time between mm -hmm. that. Um, but like to help Blaine know that we're going to eat like dinner is probably the only one where it's like okay we're going to eat the transition time. out of play time into eat time yes Ooh. so well and normally it's ipad time like mm -hmm. we have like safe time after school so it's you get your ipad or whatever and you do what you want i'm not you have to de you have to transition from school like exactly we yeah. have the whole bus ride and then whatever you need to do when you get home. Um, 
And because normally by that point, the mask is off, the frustration is out and right. Um, so normally I say mom and dad are having whatever for dinner. Are you going to eat that? Or would you like something else? And normally I'm ignored because iPad It's not really ignoring. He just can't actively hear me. So then I usually have to like tap him or like rub his back and be like, buddy, what are you eating for dinner? Right. <laughs> um, and so normally it's chicken <laughs> and he does not mean chicken breast. Blaine totally means chicken nuggets. Chicken so, nuggets. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, it's more just the way I present it than anything else. If somebody is over for dinner, I typically try and make something that Blaine will eat mac and cheese, spaghetti and meatballs, just because there are certain moments I don't want to navigate conversations with other people. <laughs> About right. how I do things. So, right. you know, that. I, right. I did say something to my mother last night because we put the food on the table and I was like, I think this is the first time we've ever put the food on the table. I don't think Blaine even knows what we're doing with the food <laughs> on the table. And Blaine kept going, do you want salad? Here's, I, I give you salad. <laughs> it's like trying to like, and everybody's like, we don't want salad. Like we're right. okay. Um, which was funny, but yeah. No, I, so there's no like giant transformation or transition thing. It's just more of a knowing there's probably going to be a different thing. Like Blaine does not eat tacos on taco night. We're going to need chicken nuggets. Right. Those types of things. But yeah. Yeah. What about you for Jordan? Um, I mean, it depends. It, it depends. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Jordan is more than capable of taking care of himself. Um, nine times out of 10, he will wait. Mm. Um, if that's what has to happen. Um, but that causes a certain amount of stress. Um, especially being in the military and having to be careful with the food that you eat and food is constantly and your weight is constantly uh, an issue. Um, you know, he's a Marine. So even more so like they're very, very, very strict guidelines for that. And, and um, so he needs to have some kind of joy around that. And if, you know, so I have to think in advance, right, of is there going to be something available? You know, we wish, we wish that there was a regular schedule. Mm -hmm. It would be wonderful if there were a regular schedule of eight to five or whatever, but that's not the case. Um, but for him, the trigger is I come home from work it's time to eat. And so I have to make sure that there's something available and that we've had a conversation um, so that he can do that if I'm not going to be available. You know, I'm home right now, um, but if I'm not home or if I'm in the middle of a call or I'm working at home, um, when he gets home from work, he has to be able to to have that. For me, on the other hand, it is I can't eat if I don't want to. Mm. Like it's I'm going to vomit if I have to eat that. And so I'm not going to. Um, so there's that issue. And a lot of times. I just eat popcorn for dinner. We've done that a lot. <laughs> um, it, it's a safe thing for me. Um, it helps me, you know, come down from my day. But like with all of the construction and everything, the if I am dealing with a lot of sensory stuff throughout the day, 
I am not going to be able to eat any kind of dinner. Yeah. So it's going to be popcorn for dinner. That's what it's going to be. Um, so there's that right? Mom, like that's yeah. a thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we do that, but it's butter noodles. See, I mean, yeah. we do popcorn sometimes, but most of the time, if, if we're all having a day, it's butter. I just stopped buying pasta at this point because that was the only way to stop us from eating it. But like, I yeah. totally get that. <laughs> I try, I, I tried to do the, I'm not going to have any popcorn thing that, that does not work for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm not willing to go through the stress of that. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm just, I'm no longer willing to go through the stress of that. I spent my entire life dealing with food issues. Mm -hmm. um, and I cannot eat sugar and I cannot eat bread and I cannot eat all of these things. Popcorn is if something were to happen where medically I could not eat that, it would be a real true struggle for mm -hmm. me, honestly. Makes sense. Again, that doesn't necessarily have to do with transitions, but it kind of does. Transitioning out of your day after having like massive sensory issues throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And then you're trying to you're trying to transition from a period of that high stress where your sympathetic nervous system is on and your fight flight and you're trying yeah. to transition and move out of the stress response cycle and into a more relaxed state where your parasympathetic nervous system is, is engaged. Um, sometimes for me, that's a bag of popcorn. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the only thing that's going to work for me at that time. I've done, I've walked, I've exercised, I'm getting enough sleep. I've engaged in something that makes me really happy studying the nervous system or whatever it is. Um, and I'm still on edge. Yeah. I can eat a bag of popcorn. And through that process, that long process, it takes me a long time to get through that, you know, yeah. piece by piece. Um, that can help me a lot. Right. And I think that overall, the big thing that we've kind of talked about the whole, ep this whole episode is kind of, yes, there are major transitions that like even a neurotypical person would be like, yeah, that's a transition. But for us as neurodivergent folks, like every change of attention. Yes. Is it is a transition and we struggle at different levels with those ch switches in our attention. Like we have to move from this thing to that thing and doing that is what is most. It's an energy expenditure yeah. that a lot of neurotypical people don't have. Mm -hmm. And I'm, and some do, Right? right. Some do. That's it's we're not saying transitions are hard for us and they're not hard for you. That's not right. the case. But for people who struggle with transitions and maybe there are a lot of people out there who haven't recognized that. Yes. Who haven't recognized that about themselves and they're stressed a lot, mm -hmm. but they don't know why. It's like, let's look at these little things in your life and let's look at some of the things that you do that make you feel good. When is that happening? And sometimes we can pinpoint, okay, it's because you struggle with this transition. Right. How can we mitigate that? How can we make it a little bit easier? Yeah. So I'm going to give us a big transition here, which is ironic. We obviously could talk forever. <laughs> we could. We could. But we said we wanted to be at less than an hour. And, and we're going to get there. less than 45 minutes. <laughs> Right. So we're not quite under 45 minutes, but we're pretty close. Um, so we're going to make a huge transition here and end the episode. <laughs> yes, it needs to happen. It, it needs, needs to, to happen. happen. Um, but yes, so. It needs to happen and um, we can talk about things on future episodes and we will put a link down below for um, anybody, if they have a topic that they would like to discuss or questions for us, they can um, actually just fill that in and uh, 
it's stuff that we can address um, in future episodes and we would love for people to do that. So that's gonna be um, down in the notes. Um, so yeah, do you have anything else that you wanna add? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Awesome. awesome. Okay. Everybody, thanks for listening to Drudgery Dreams and In Between, a weekly live podcast coming to you every Tuesday at 9 a.m. Central, 7 a.m. Pacific. Um, subscribe now wherever podcasts are found. If you'd like to support the podcast, be sure to leave a rating and review and share with your friends. To catch all the latest from us, visit us at drudgeryanddreams.com and follow on your favorite social media platforms at Drudgery and Dreams. Thanks again. See you next time. Yeah.